Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing and encouragement and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with his word, and more in love with people. Amen. Aren't you thankful that we have a living hope? Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the Lord's house uh, with you today. And uh, man, it's been a busy weekend. I know the college and career class uh, ministry, they had a cookout and a bonfire on Friday night. And then the ladies got together last night to have fiesta. There's so much fiesta that went on last night. My wife is at home sick. What did you do to her? All you ladies, I blame all of you. No, no, please pray for her. She is at home not feeling well today. And uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, when she's not here with me, I miss her. And, uh, and so uh, pray for her that she would feel better this morning. I also want to ask you to be praying for a number of others. Uh, certainly we uh, pray for James Granahan and his continued treatment and, and all the uh, side effects that he's dealing with right now. But uh, he is strong and greater than his strength is the strength that resides inside of him, the strength of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so pray for James Granahan. Pray for, uh, I know, I don't know if I've seen Ron this morning, but pray for Mary Fellens. Uh, Ron's wife uh, had surgery back earlier this year to remove a brain tumor, has gone back for more MRIs. Uh, something is not right. Her eyesight is still affected, still dealing with headaches. Want to pray for her. Uh, look over here and see Randy. We're already praying for Randy's dad, Roger. Uh, he was diagnosed just the other day with Parkinson's disease. And so we want to continue to pray uh, for Roger Litzinger. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, I look down here and I see Rosalie and Jim. And uh, we're so grateful for what the Lord is doing. But man, we need to pray for them. That they would be strong and in the power of our Lord's might. And so continue to pray for them. Sitting right behind Rosalie is Darren. And I know his heart is heavy today as one of his good friends is in the hospital, Ron Borta. Many of you have mentioned and been praying for Ron. He's waiting. He's literally in the hospital right now. They've got his heart on a balloon set up waiting for a heart transplant, which is, which is I understand, a weird prayer because you have to have a heart to be able to transplant it. So we pray for not only the donor and the donor's family, but we pray for Ron and his situation there and so many others, Joe. And uh, I, I didn't see Rhonda this morning. She's probably with Joe, but uh, Joe Chambers continuing to recover. Uh, we need that to move along, uh, that he might get the uh, regain, regain the strength that he needs in his legs and certainly Sonny is at home and Jamie wants him to get recovered right now, real quick. She's ready, yeah, she's giving the thumbs up. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to being with you, but here's what I want us to do. Let's pray uh, and then we're gonna get started. In fact, before we pray, I wanna remind everybody, and I didn't ask the guys to do this, so we've been talking about family matters over the past couple of weeks, and I wanna remind everybody of our initial imperatives when it comes to this series. And number one, uh, imperative that we need. Man, these guys are right on time. Look at them. I didn't even tell them I was going to do this. Number one, God is God and I am not. Amen? Everybody agree? Anybody think you're God? Okay, I think number one works. Number two is that the Bible is God's word. We either believe that this book is his word, his holy word, his inspired word, his inerrant word. We either believe it's absolute truth or we don't. So that's imperative number two. Number three it shouldn't surprise us, but God's thoughts and God's ways are much higher and holier than our thoughts and our ways. Amen? Number four is where we start to get a little quiet. Because, see, number four, there's sometimes that we think we're right. Anybody ever felt like you've been right before? Say, I've been right before. I hear all the guys trying to prove to their wives that they were right at one point. Right? We... Sometimes we think we have good ideas. Sometimes we actually think that we could counsel God on some things. We give him some suggestions, right? But the moment that you think you're smarter than God, you're not. 
The moment you think you're humble, you're not. We could go on with these all day, right? Uh, so our thoughts and our ways may seem right, but the Bible says our ways and our thoughts, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. And then last but not least, since we've been talking about family matters, we want to just say that it's God who builds the home. The Lord builds the home. If we try, if we labor to build it on our own, we will fail. So with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer and see what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're so grateful to be in your house today. Thankful for the beautiful day that you've given us, another day to come and to sing and to worship you and to give you the glory that you so richly deserve. And God, I'm thankful today that I don't have to worry about the battle because the battle belongs to you. God, I'm thankful that the battle has already been won through Jesus Christ, that I don't have to worry what comes today or tomorrow, that at the end of it all, you are still on your throne, you are still in control because you have authority, because you are our living hope. God, I pray that you would speak through me in this message. I pray that this message would, and your word would fall upon the good soil of our hearts. God, I pray that as we discuss a, a serious matter today, God, I pray that you would give us wisdom to hear what you have to say. But not only to hear it, but God, to be able to be honest with ourselves in such a way that we might apply what we hear and endeavor to make change. God, I pray that you would be with us now as we look at your word. I pray that you would be with those who are here or watching online. Maybe there's somebody in our midst that's, that's heard a lot about Jesus, that's, that knows a lot about Jesus, but has never trusted Christ as their Savior. God, I pray that you would draw that person unto yourself where they might find forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. Lord, without Jesus, we are all most miserable. And so, Lord, I thank you and praise you for what you'll do. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight because you are my strength and you are my redeemer. We praise you and pray this in the precious and powerful name of your son and for his sake, amen and amen. Well, on the offset, I just want to say uh, emotions are a part of life. Every one of us in this room, we are all, anybody say I'm an emotional person? Somebody say I'm an emotional person. I know there's some emotional people out here. And the reality is that emotions are a very real part of the family dynamic. Anybody ever had a family full of emotions? You ever got together on Thanksgiving and things go this way and that way? I mean, I can't even imagine what goes on at some of y'all's Thanksgiving dinners. I mean, I hear some of y'all families got like 30 and 40 people at, at a time gathered together. I mean, I know that's got to be crazy. But we're all emotional people, and, and the reality is that we feel love, we feel joy and happiness, we feel sorrow, we feel guilt and disappointment, and on and on the list could go. And it's not really a bad thing that we are emotional, uh, because we were created in the image of God, and so uh, God's emotions are seen all throughout Scripture. He is an emotional God. He sees and, uh, and responds with emotion, but when we think of his emotions, we need to remember that his emotions are rooted in holiness. His emotions are, are rooted in holiness. They flow from his perfection, and they are always, always, always expressed without sin. But you know, sometimes we get so emotional, it becomes sinful, doesn't it? Sometimes we let our emotions get the best of us. And uh, the reality, though, is emotions in and of themselves are neither good, but how we deal with emotions is pretty important. In fact, someone has said this, said, we will either manage our emotions or they will manage us. And so scripture gives us a strategy for success, and, and I'm just going to give it to you. It's just a little thought. You might want to write it down a little bit later and come back to it. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 16, the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you want to have victory over any emotion, now we're, I haven't even revealed what emotion we're going to talk about. Uh, well, I guess I have. Did they put the title up behind me? They've already revealed it. It's already, the secret's out. <laughs> if we're going to have victory over any emotion, the reality is we need to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. By the way, they put the title up because that's what I asked them to do. That wasn't their fault. That was my fault. <laughs> 
So, so the reality is we're to walk in the spirit. But sadly, one of the main reasons I think that families tend to kind of uh, be at war. You ever been at war with a family member? Anybody? Anybody willing to say, yeah, I've been at war with a family member? <laughs> so, so, so you stand up and give testimony. I've been at war with a family member. You know, the reason why we tend to be at war with family members many times is because we don't walk in the spirit. We walk according to what I want. We walk according to, to that three-person rule, me, myself, and I. We, we walk according to uh, my thoughts and my ways. And so uh, we end up walking in the flesh rather than the spirit. And, and actually, James supports this theory in James chapter 4 and verse number 1. Notice what James says. He said, from whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Notice he says these words. He says, come they not hence even of your lusts? that war in your members. Now, we'll get into this idea of lust and everything, and, and I'm not talking about sexual lust, but the reality is even in our communication, and I, I shared this about six or seven years ago. We, we were doing another thing, but I'm going to share it again, Lord willing, next week. Even in our communication, our, our communication is driven by what we lust, what we desire. I want to have agreement. I want to be right. I want to be heard for crying out loud. And so we lust to have that in our communication and it drives our communication. And the same thing is true when it comes to this emotion that we're going to talk about today, this emotion of anger. Because the reality is the emotion that is most affected in our lives, if we're honest with one another, yes, we feel love, joy, happiness, and sorrow, and guilt, and disappointment, and on and on. But the emotion that we are most affected all, uh, by, by our own selfish desires, watch this, is anger. Our selfish desires, what we lust for, drives anger many times. Merriam-Webster defines anger this way. It says, anger is a strong feeling of displeasure and usually in opposition, watch it, to someone or something. Have you ever been angry with someone? Have you ever been angry at something? I'd say we've been living in about a three-year stupor of anger about the things that are taking place in our country and on and on. But we have to be very careful as children of the Most High God. Biblically speaking, there are two basic types of anger. And I guess, and if you want to write them down, I'm guessing you could guess what they are. Number one would be godly or righteous anger, which is an emotion of displeasure similar to God's anger or wrath that arises, watch it, in response to sin and injustice. Now, when you look at godly anger, most of the time throughout Scripture, when we see this type of anger, it refers to God's anger, not ours. See, all throughout Scripture, you'll see uh, uh, references to wrath, to, to anger, and on and on. But most of the time, it's referring to God's dealing of anger. Remember, I said that God's emotions are rooted in holiness. God's emotions flow from His perfection, and God's emotions are never expressed in sin. And so it's okay. In fact, Psalm 7 in verse number 11 says, God is angry with the wicked, watch this, every day. You know, God's angry with the wicked every day. Have you ever gotten up for a whole week in a row, every day you're angry? Anybody? You just wake up angry. They call it, back in the day, they used to say he got up or she got up on the wrong side of the bed. Right? We get up and we're angry for whatever reason. Romans 1.18 declares that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. 1 Peter 3.12 tells us that the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So even when, like sometimes we, we want to be God's helper. We want to tell God, God, why aren't you angry? God, why don't you do something? Why don't you zap somebody with the holy zapping? Like, we, we like think that we can counsel God on when he should be angry. But can I tell you that even when God seems to be silent, doesn't it feel like sometimes God is silent? Even when God seems, or maybe you feel or you think that God is silent concerning sin that is running rampant, I can assure you from the very authority of God's word that his holy displeasure to sin continues every day. This is who he is. This is a part of our great God. However, on the flip side, we see the emotion of anger, but on the flip side, in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, and verse number 9, the Bible tells us that our Lord is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. So you may be wondering, well, how is God perfectly angry and and how does he hate sin and at the same time how can he be long suffering that's when you got to go back to imperative number one he's God and I am not (laughs) it's like how could I mean the Bible says you just said he's angry at sin every day and yet you just show me that he's long suffering he's not willing he's a loving God he wants everyone to come to repentance how does that work you'll have to ask him someday By the way, you might want to consider asking him, how did it work in our own life? See, because what we like to do when we think about God's anger is like, we want want to heap God's anger on somebody else, right? We don't want God's anger on us. We're like, God, I'm a good person. We want to heap it on somebody else. Oh, but he's long-suffering. Sadly, though, we tend to let our so-called righteous anger. Hey, has anyone in this room ever been angry with sin? I hope so. I hope you're angry with sin today, (laughs) right? We ought to be angry with sin. We ought to be angry at evil. But you know what happens sometimes? I think we let our so-called righteous anger become unrighteous really quickly. We get get angry at things. We get angry at people, and it becomes unrighteous very quickly, and it becomes this, this version of anger that God is not interested in us having. That's why anger, it's such a delicate emotion. That's why we should walk in the Spirit. Therefore, the second type of biblical anger, I guess you would have already guessed this, is ungodly anger. There it is, number two. Ungodly, unrighteous, sinful anger, which is a violent, watch this, it is a violent emotion of displeasure or antagonism that often leads to plans for revenge or punishment and is characterized as a great sin. Now, this type of anger, this type of anger actually, when it occurs, it occurs when our desire uh, to, when, it's, when our desire to rule us, when it desires to rule us and, and actually take precedence over our desire to please God. So instead of pleasing God, anger, this unbiblical, this ungodly anger, seeks to rule us, seeks to take advantage of us, take precedence in our life in the place of living a life, living the abundant life, if you please, a life that pleases God. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22 and 21, Jesus said these words. He said, you have heard that it was said by them of old that thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. In verse 22, though, he says this. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever is angry with his brother, and and that's neuter, so we could say brother or sister without a cause... Shall be, shall be in danger of the judgment. And so what this is talking about is an anger that is based on anything other than a zeal for godliness and a hatred for sin. Our emotions have impacted us so greatly since the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned by allowing their emotions, by us allowing our emotions to, to kind of dictate our lives. That's not, that's not the godly response. It's not the godly response. Ephesians 4, 26 puts it this way by saying, be ye angry and sin not. In other words, exercising godly anger towards sin is one thing, but when the emotion of anger becomes focused on a person rather than the problem, it becomes sin. In James chapter 1 and verse number 20, the Bible says, for the wrath or sinful anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Unholy, ungodly anger never, ever, ever pleases God. Proverbs 25 and 28 says, He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken and without walls. I like what Matthew Henry said in response to this one verse. He said, The man who has no command of his anger is easily robbed of peace. If you've got unchecked, ungodly anger running rampant in your home, your home is going to be robbed of peace. Anybody here this morning? Hello? You notice sometimes, Travis, others who have spoken, it gets real quiet. It gets real quiet. Now, I'm not going to ask who robbed a store or do anything like that, right? But it gets real quiet and our feet start to hurt for some reason. When we start talking about things that are a little too close to home. Can I lovingly tell you, 
that the reason I'm talking to you about beware of danger, i.e. anger, is because God doesn't want us to be, to be locked into this emotion of ungodly anger. He wants us to have freedom and liberty from it. And so you may be here and you say, oh, how did he know I'm such an angry person? <laughs> I didn't. But God knows what's going on inside of our hearts. And so if we need to do business with the Lord today, you might say, this might be the reason God has this message in store for us. Okay? It's okay to deal with these things. Unbiblical anger. Listen, uh, Matthew Henry, notice again, he says, the man who has no command of his anger is easily robbed of his peace. He went on to say this. He lies, he lies exposed to all the temptations of Satan and becomes an easy prey to that enemy. When we are in our home and we let anger have its way, not God, when we give over, when we let anger rule the day, when we let anger, ungodly anger, have precedence in our home, there is no peace. And not only is there no peace, we become susceptible to all types of temptation. Family members, listen, family matters. So if you struggle with ungodly anger, not only are we going to be devoid of this peace, but we have to be careful because there's a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. So with that said, you guys trying to figure out where we're going, turn with me back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. All the way back, we, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about that God created male and female. Male and female had the, uh, various roles and responsibilities, and male and female were joined in marriage. And, uh, and we, we continued last week by looking at the example of, uh, of mom and grandma, <laughs> Lois and Eunice, and... Uh, in the life of Timothy and how important that was. And today I want us to go back and look at this story that may seem very familiar to us. But as we'll see, when you get to Genesis chapter 4, as you'll see, it doesn't take very long for tragedy to strike this very first family in the Bible. Because, And again, because of humanity's fall, the cause of tragedy, and to be honest, quite honestly, all of tragedy in life, in, to some degree or another, to some degree, all of tragedy in life is the result of this not-so-popular three-letter word. It's called sin, right? My mother-in-law always asks me, you know, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And so last night, and, and the reason is uh, um, her father-in-law pastored out in uh, Missouri years ago, and she would ask him what he was preaching on, and every time she ever asked him what he was preaching on, he said, sin, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so last night I was, I was at the ironing board trying to get all gussied up for you. And uh, she walked by and uh, I said, well, Queen Mother, I said, uh, it finally happened. And she said, what? And she, I said, you know, you always ask what I'm preaching on. And she, as, soon as, as soon as I asked the question, she said, sin. <laughs> and so she remembered even that. Oh, listen, when it comes to anger, God reminds us in verse number seven, as we'll see here in just a second, he reminds us in verse number seven that sin lies at the door. James 1 in verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Oh, listen, the wages of sin is death. We have to be careful of this thing of ungodly anger because the wages of sin is death. Ecclesiastes 2.26 says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail. Oh, is sin or is sin or is the sin of ungodly anger about to destroy you or a family this morning? Because that's exactly what it did here in Genesis chapter 4. You may recall... After God created male and female in Genesis chapter 1, you remember the very first thing that God says to him in Genesis 1, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1 and verse 28? He creates male and female, and then he tells Adam and Eve, he says, be fruitful. <laughs> he says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. Take, take a hold. Uh, use this earth that I have created for you. And as we begin chapter 4, they've been banished from the garden. And you'll notice they're out to the east of the Garden of Eden, so to speak. They've set up shop here, and, uh, which is kind of ironic because when I read the scripture, it's almost as if uh, it's a little extra punishment. You're outside of the garden, but you can still see the garden. 
Sometimes I think that's what happens when ungodly anger gets a hold of us. We see the abundant life that we could have in our family, but we allow ourselves to be controlled by an emotion rather than allowing ourselves to be controlled by the very word and spirit of God. And so they're out there and they're banished from the garden, but here, look at Genesis 4, they're now, they're now experiencing joy of, ex, of, of childbirth. They've had a child, but notice what it says here in verse 1. Verse number 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife. There's a little thought for us. That's a different message for a different time. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man. Where did she get it from? From the Lord. She said, I got it from the Lord. It's a reminder that all life, every life is, is sacred. Every life is given from God. And that's another message as well for another time. Look at verse 2. Verse number 2. And by the way, there's so much here. Like even how she names this first child. I mean, Cain's name actually comes from that phrase that she had received this man child from the Lord. It's actually an uh, uh, illustration of what God had done. So even his name is tied in. And, and the sad part is so is Abel's name. We could do a search on this and a study on this, but that, just for the sake of time, bear with me. Look at verse 2. It reveals the arrival of Abel, and then we jump forward in time. Can I just say this? Cain and Abel are not boys any longer. These are grown men by this time. You say, how do you know this? Because verse number 2 tells us here, it says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So both of these guys have certain occupations that Adam was given, that Adam was instructed to do from the very beginning. And so dad is teaching the boys, hey, this is your new life. You're going to either be a keeper of the sheep or you're going to be a tiller of the ground. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. There weren't very many occupations. There were no accountants back then. There was no need for lawyers yet. <laughs> there were no need for doctors. Adam had become basically the priest of the family, so to speak, right, at this time. And so we see these young boys, they're out there, they're, they're operating worthy and needed positions here on earth. But moving on to verse number three and following, notice the Bible reveals this. It says, in the process of time. In other words, at the end of days, a prescribed time. Uh, when we say at the end of time, you, you might say, well, what was the end of time, the process of time, rather? What was the end of days? Was it a year? Was it, was it after? Was, it, was he setting up the Passover? Was he setting up, was it the end of the work week? What was it? To be honest, no real theologian knows exactly what the process of time is. And so it's kind of futile to kind of dig into that little deep hole. But the Bible says in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect, or that word had respect, that phrasing there, means that the Lord actually looked upon with satisfaction. He looked upon Abel's offering with satisfaction. And then verse number 5 says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So in other words, he did not look upon Cain's offering with satisfaction. So when we do a deep dive into the totality of Scripture, we can conclude that at some point divine instructions had been given. Divine instructions had been given about offering to God. Do you know that those instructions... I know we're living in the New Testament. This is not a message on that, uh, but, but they're still intact. We're to, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We are to offer ourselves to God in response for what he has done to us. And so it goes on. But when we do a deep dive, we can see that divine instructions have been given and been adopted and uh, because what I see here, look at verse number three again. It says, at a prescribed time, Cain and Abel brought offerings to the Lord. And, and here's the deal. Because in verse number four, we see that God has respect unto Abel's offering and he doesn't have respect to Cain's. And so it's not really the focus of the message, but I'm going to give you some, some thoughts here. Because everybody seems to ask, well, why did God reject Cain's offering?" What was it that made him reject Cain's offering? 
Well, there are a number of theories, and, and I just want to caution you about holding on to one and only one. I would suggest that all of these are, are, are somewhat seen throughout Scripture. I don't believe that you can prove wholeheartedly one over the other, but I'm going to give you some thoughts here. And number one, some suggest that God's rejection was because of the type of offering that was given. You see, notice Abel, he offers a blood sacrifice. Cain, he offers a bloodless sacrifice. Let me ask, how many is that the first time you've ever heard that? Anybody, is that the first time you've heard that? Some of you have not heard that. I was talking to people even this week, and, and they were saying, I had never heard that before. So some believe that it was because he had offered a blood sacrifice, but Cain had not. The point being that Cain made an offering, but his offering was, watch this, in acknowledgement of God. In other words, yeah, God, I acknowledge you, so there. When we offer ourselves like that, that is not a sacrifice well-pleasing unto God. When we say, hey, yeah, I get it. The pastor said you're God and I'm not, so, huh. I can assure you that God, if we go back to the Hebrew here, he is not going to look upon that sacrifice with satisfaction, right? And so we see that Cain makes this offering in acknowledgement to God while Abel's offering is made in recognition of his own sinfulness and his own need before God. This is the theory behind this first thought. You may remember Adam and Eve, they sin in the garden. The Bible says they hide themselves, which is kind of futile, but they try to hide themselves from God. They cover themselves from his presence and on and on. In verse number nine of chapter three, God calls on Adam. He says, hey, come out, come out from wherever you are. He says, where are you at, Adam? And then he says, why are you covering yourself up? What's going on? He has this discussion with Adam about what's going on because the reality is God says, hey, Adam, I got news for you. Your sin has exposed you. How did you know you were naked? That's how you were created. How do you now know that you're naked? His sin had exposed him. And so what God was saying, he's like, listen, he's like, Adam, you can't sow enough fig leaves together to cover your sin. And so there's, there's those that believe that after pronouncing his judgment on Adam and Eve, this reveals that God does what they could not do in chapter 3 and verse 21. The Bible says that God, he literally, unto Adam and also unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. In other words, God was saying there's no cheap answer for sin. God was showing them a blood sacrifice had to be offered. Now, in that chapter 3, just a thought. Do you think God was angry at their sin? Anybody? I think he was pretty angry. But in love and in mercy. Watch this. In love and in mercy, God shows Adam and Eve what could be done temporarily and also gives them a picture, future, of what would be done permanently, right, through the blood of Jesus Christ to atone for sin. And so I very wholeheartedly believe and see that in chapter 3. But since the Levitical law and the Mosaic law had not come into being as of yet, we have to be cautious about just looking at that one idea. Some actually say that God's rejection, number two, was based on the kind of offering. Scripture points out, look at verse 4, it points out that Abel offered his very best while Cain offered his very least. Look at verse 4. Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. When it says the fat thereof, he's talking about the very best that he had to offer. But in verse number 3, the Bible says Cain brought forth, brought out of the fruit of the ground. In other words, he brought a portion. He brought some of the produce. He brought some corn. He brought some seeds. He brought some, he brought some of what was gained from tilling the ground. And so, in other words, this theory suggests that the selection of their gift re revealed Cain and Abel's state of mind, which then ties to the last thought, which is that others actually believe that God's rejection was based on how the offering was given. How the offering was given. Abel's offering was given with a right heart attitude, and Cain's was not given with a right heart attitude, but he gave it, notice I already said this, he gave it out of obligation. He said, okay, I acknowledge your God here. And so there's these thoughts that run around. And we could do a big deep dive today and spend all day looking at it, but I believe Hebrews chapter 11 kind of sums up our quest. 
In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4, notice what the Bible says. It says, by faith. Here we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness, watch it, that what? He was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet he spoke. So I had to ask myself a question when I read that. How would Abel know what to offer and how to offer it, and Cain not know? The reality is they both knew. They both knew. I got news for you. I'm guessing since in the process of time they brought a gift or of offering that Adam had to instruct his boys on what was required to bring God. So whether we look at the right heart attitude or we look at whether they gave the best or their least or we look at a blood sacrifice or a bloodless sacrifice, the reality is they would have known exactly and both of them would have known. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. He knew. You want to know why I say he knew? Because the Bible says faith cometh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Adam would have instructed. And you want to know something else? Not everything that we need to know uh, about what took place is right here. This is a special revelation of God. You can't hypothesize and neither can I. God may have already talked to both of them directly. And said, hey, at this point, you're going to do this. At this point, you're going to do this. We don't know. But what we do know is in the process of time, they brought a gift. And one was accepted and one was rejected. Now, continuing on, verse number five. Look at the last part of verse number five. The Bible says Cain was very wroth and his, cont and his uh, uh, countenance fell. Interestingly enough, Scripture tells us that Cain was angry on the inside. Watch this. And his anger could be seen on the outside. See, look at it. It says, he was very wroth and his countenance fell. Something happened to his face when he got angry. Let me ask a question. Anything ever happen to your face when you get angry? Anybody ever get red in the head? Come on. Come on, somebody. I know you're out there. Where are you, angry people? <laughs> I know you're out there. You're hiding. You might hide it from me. But you ain't for hiding it from God. See, God says he got angry on the inside. But his anger showed on the outside. Oh, this is so dangerous because families matter. Families matter. Oh, listen, I think about ungodly anger. It's not only felt, but it can always be seen as well. Proverbs 14, 17 says, He that is soon angry deals foolishly. He that is soon angry deals foolishly. And a man of wicked devices is hated. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. The Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. My title depicts that anger is only one letter away from the word danger. Oh, listen, when we live in anger or bitterness, we better beware because as God says in verse number seven, if you don't take control of your anger, if you don't get a handle on it, sin lies at the door, which is exactly what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. He says, listen, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And then the very next verse, he says, neither give place to the devil. In other words, if you don't deal with your anger, ungodly anger, you're leaving the door open. And I got news for you. That slimy devil, he'll crawl in. You give, him a, you give him an inch, he'll take a foot, right? So to speak. Oh, listen, we have to be careful with this. In verses number six and seven, look, we see Cain refusing God's counsel. God says in verse six, he says, And the Lord God said unto Cain, Why are you angry? Why art thou wroth? And why is your face affected? Why is your countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. In other words, I have to go back to the point that they knew what was expected because God says, hey, you know how to do right? You've been instructed. You know what the right process for offering a, a gift to me is inquires. So Cain, why are you so angry? Stop with all the anger and just do right. In fact, I almost titled the message, Do Right. He says, just do right. It's going to be well. It's going to be okay with you. 
But what I see here in verse 6 and 7 is that sometimes God has to bring you and I to the point where he shows us that we are wrong and that we are in error. And lest anybody think that God is the bad guy in this, in this uh, uh, story, I want to remind you of Proverbs 3 and verse number 12. Guys, if we have that, show it. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. So you say, well, Abel, he had this testimony, he's righteous, and evidently, and I'm going to read you a verse here in a second from 1 John chapter 3, you're going to see that uh, Cain, it says his ways were evil, and so you're going to say, oh, one was wicked and one wasn't. The reality is that God corrects Cain because he loves him. He says, no, 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 I love you too much to let you do this. You are my creation. I gave you to your mom and dad. Again, remember his mom says, I have gotten this man from the Lord. And so God confronts him with truth. He shows him how to take care of it. And he does the same thing with you and I. He tells us how to swallow our pride and do the right thing. But unfortunately, when we are angry, it doesn't matter whether God or whether it's someone else correcting us. You know what we typically do when somebody else corrects us? Anybody? Come on. You know what we do? We get angrier. We're like, how dare you tell me I'm angry? We get on our hobby horse, our holy hobby horse. We're like, you don't know what anger looks like. You want to see some anger? You come here tomorrow. I'll show you anger. Okay. But that's what we do, right? And when we see it from God's word, and I dare say, listen, remember, I'm just communicating the message. You may be angry right now because you thought you were going to come in here, little feel-good, fancy, free, prosperity-driven gospel message. Well, not here. Because God wants us to understand the dangers. The danger to you. The danger to your family. And it doesn't have to be the husband. It doesn't have to be the wife. It could be the young people in our, in our families. Listen, I too was once young. But now I am old. But I remember when I was young. Oh, listen, you don't think I spun a few webs in my time? Young people... You think you're smarter than everyone else? Oh, I used to spin the same webs you try to spin. Pit one against the other. If I didn't, it, listen, I don't know in your house, but in my house, the boys learned very quickly who to go to if they wanted to ask permission for something. They understood that if they wanted to, to uh, be able to do something, they'd come to me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I played good cop. Mom was the bad cop. Some, some of you young couples are trying to figure out who the good cop and the bad cop is. You better figure it out real quick because that boy is about to uh, start working on you guys back there in the corner. <laughs> we get angry even when we're corrected from God's word. We get angry when our friends correct us. You know what? We ought to be correcting one another and we ought to be men and women who are able to handle that correction. Speak the truth in love. Now, there's a way to correct, speak the truth in love, right? But we ought to be all about that, and we ought to be very, very thankful for Psalm 103 and verse number 8. Because Psalm 103 and verse number 8 tells us that our Lord is merciful and gracious, and that he is what? Slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. By the way, when God asks us a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Has, have you ever felt like God's asking you a question and you're like, why are you asking me this? It's like when he comes into the garden, he's like, hey, Adam, where are you? Well, first of all, you just created Adam. You placed him in the garden. You know where he's at. It's not that he doesn't know the answer. It's that he's wanting us to kind of, kind of see things through a different set of lenses from a different perspective. And so when he asked Cain about his anger, he's just wanting Cain to stop and to realize and to recognize the situation that he found himself in from God's perspective and not his own selfish perspective. Look at verse number 8. Because as a result of ignoring and refusing God's um, counsel, which is exactly what we do many times, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. Can you imagine you ever had that? Where you get chastised by the Lord and you want to go talk to a family member. Man, I don't know, man. God's word is pointing out something. I don't know. If, uh, what should I do? What should I... He talks with Cain. He takes him out in the field, the Bible says. They're out in the field and Cain rose up. And this thing goes sideways real quick. Cain rose up 
against Abel, his brother, the Bible says, and he slew him. That's King James for killed. He slew him. He put him to death. And in a sense, that's what our ungodly anger does to our family each and every day. That's why it's so dangerous. Oh yeah, we may not physically kill one another, but anger unchecked brings about the same destruction, which is why Jesus said, if we're angry with our brother without a cause, we're in danger of judgment. In Matthew chapter 5, 22. In 1 John chapter 3, I alluded to it just a moment ago. The Bible declares, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, there's a key, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him. So in other words, the Bible's asking, why did he kill him? Well, look, there's the answer. Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So here's what happened. God says, no, 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 no. You need to go back and do right. And if you do right, it's going to be fine. But if you don't do right, sin lies at your door. So here's what Cain does. He looks and he says, well, his, his gift, his offering was accepted. And so what does he do? He becomes jealous. He says, God, why did you look at his gift? You, you took his gift, but not my gift. And so what we do is we start playing this or that with one another. And we say, well, why did you bless this one? Man, this person over here is a sinner. God, I serve you. I, I teach a Sunday school class. I sing in the choir. I play the bass. Wasn't that good this morning, Regina? Playing the bass guitar, right? Have you ever seen a, 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 an adult woman play the bass like that? That was amazing. People were taking your photo. That's a different story. The reality is, guys, that sometimes we offer all the things we do to God while pointing at someone else and we see they're not angry. We see God accepting them. We see God blessing them. And what we do is we convince ourselves that it's their fault. And that's what Cain did. He looks at Abel and he says, oh, it's your fault. No, it's not Abel's fault. But this is what he does. He refuses God's counsel and then he kills his own brother. And so his ungodly anger not only leads him to kill uh, Abel, but then he tries to hide it. And then he lies about it. Look at verse number 9 and 10. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is thy Abel thy brother? And he said, I, I, he said, I know not. What a liar. Now not only is he a murderer, but he's a liar, just like the devil. John chapter 8 and verse 44, the Bible says he's not only a murderer, but he's also the father of lies. He's done everything, right? He says, he says, I don't know. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. In this case, yes, you are. Look at verse 10. And he said, what dost thou, what hast thou done? And then the Lord says, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. You see, Cain forgot about the omniscience of God. And so do we sometimes. But I got news for you. There's always a witness watching. You know, like sometimes... We like divide things up and we're like, we're going to go over here. I got this little secret thing I'm going to do over here. And I'm going to hide. And God, you can't see me, but I'm over here. I'm doing my thing. You cannot run. You cannot hide from God. He sees us. He sees the ungodly anger that runs rampant. Oh, he not only sees all, but he knows all. David knew this in Psalm 139. He proclaims this in verse 7. He says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead thee, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, he says in verse 12, Yea, darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. Listen, there's nowhere that you and I can run or hide when it comes to these little secret sins of our lives. Jeremiah in 23, in verse 24, the Bible says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Verse 3. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Oh, friend, there's nothing that you and I can hide. 
It was Lewis, Lewis Sperry Chafer. He was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. Theologian from yesteryear. And here's what he said. He said, the secret sins of this life are the open scandals in heaven. Anger is that secret sin. It's that secret sin that lurks beneath the surface many times in the home. And as a result, God, he announces the penalty for Cain's sin. Notice verse 11 and 12. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. God says, you're guilty. You're guilty. I saw it. I knew that you did it. You're guilty. You can't lie. You can't hide. I know what you have done, Cain. And so now you are cursed from the earth. Verse number 12. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. You see Cain's ungodly anger and sin against God and the anger of murdering his brother. It leads him to murder his brother when he should have been angry with himself. And that's what anger does. Instead of being angry with the person that we really are angry with, which is ourselves, we deflect it and put it on somebody else. You know the thorns and the thistles and the weeds in your yard today are a reminder of this. Anybody got weeds in their yard? All y'all are blessed because I've got them abounding. If you want some weeds, come over and get them. The heartache, the sorrow, the weeping. They're all ongoing reminders. They're all ongoing reminders that there is an ongoing penalty for sin. Psalm 34 and 21, the Bible says, Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Proverbs 8, 36, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Sadly, Cain showed absolutely no remorse. Why? Because he was absorbed with self. And that's what anger typically does. We get so absorbed with self. See, that's, that's where it comes from. See, I selfishly want my way. And when I don't get my way, I get angry. Can I be really transparent with you? I wasn't very happy this morning when my wife woke up and she said, I can't move, I don't feel good, and I'm sick, and I won't go into all the details. But as I rode here, I was like, you dirty devil! You know I'm preaching on anger today. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody been angry this morning already? Come on, somebody, be honest. Nobody was angry. We all woke up eating bonbons. It's deadly. That's why I said beware. Beware of the danger. Look at verse 13, and I, I got to wrap this up here. No, Michaela, it's not the final verse. Look at verse 13. Sad. Look at what Cain says. He says, my punishment See, God said, you're cursed from the earth. Whatever you do, you keep tilling the ground, but it's not going uh, uh, produ to produce its strength anymore. This is what you are. You're a vagabond. For the rest of your life, you're a fugitive. He says to the Lord, my punishment, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Can I tell you the truth this morning? None of us in this room, none of us in this room are qualified or able or strong enough to bear the punishment that we deserve because of the sin of ungodly anger. But the truth is, Jesus is. He's strong enough. He's strong enough to deal with it, and he did. Romans 6, 23, I alluded to earlier, says the wages of sin is death. That's true. <laughs> but the gift... I love the last part, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isaiah 53 
and 5 and following. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone, we have turned everyone to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all, speaking of Jesus Christ. And if you go on and read that passage, I encourage you to get to verse number 10, because when you get to verse number 10 of Isaiah 53, it actually tells us that the, it, was, it pleased the Lord to do this. That's how much he loved you. That's how much he loved me. Jesus said he is the good shepherd in John 10, 11. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Oh, the voice of Abel's blood cried from the ground for justice. But the voice of Jesus' shed blood declares victory and redemption for everyone who believes. That's the good news. That we don't have to deal with it. I put in my notes, families matter because families matter to God. God told Cain that he needed to do right and master his sin. And his instruction is the same for you and I. You say, well, how do I do it? Well, God gave us a clue. If you guys will show verse number seven. He gave us a clue. He gave us a clue in what he told Cain. How do I deal with it? I hear you, family matters to God, so how do I overcome this idea of, of anger? How do I deal with it? By following what Jesus says in his book. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil, Ephesians 4, right? He says, if you'll do well, won't you be accepted? You ought to do well. Just do right. Do right, do right, do right till the stars fall from their socket. Just do right. That's what God is saying. He's saying if you'll just do well, I've told you how to do well in my word. I've told you how to get right, how to stay right, how to be right. And it's through the precious word of God. Psalm 37 and verse 8, the Bible says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You and I have a choice today. We can either choose to deal with it or we can get angry like Cain did. And you know what I fear? You know what the greatest fear I have today? Is that someone will walk out of this room or turn that computer off or TV watching online and refuse to deal with their anger and go out of here angry at God, angry with me because I preach the message. Can I tell you, God wants us to have victory over this area in our lives. And the only reason I bring it to you is because he laid it on my heart and even put me to the test this very day. By the way, the rest of the story, I text my little wife. You got any medicine? You got this, you need this, you need this. And then I end it like I end all of mine. I don't know why, just forgive me, I use the blue heart. Because I love my wife. I wasn't angry with her. But real close to letting this situation get the best of me. And I know if it comes in my life, I can't be alone, folks. In a room with hundreds of people, I can't be alone. Someone in this room has struggled with anger. Maybe even today as I have. Maybe this week. Maybe this past year. Or maybe you're doing good. You haven't had a problem with anger in 10, 15 years. Would the person who has not had an anger at all in the last 10 or 15 years please stand up? We have a gift for you. You can go to the info desk. It's a coffee mug. <laughs> I didn't say the gift was good. <laughs> if you're here, now is the time to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it now, I got news for you. As soon as you walk out those doors, 
you think you've checked out right now. As soon as you walk out those doors, this will be the last thing on your mind. But I'm going to pray right now that God would not give us rest until we deal biblically with this anger. You say, don't put that on me. I'm going to put it on you. Not because I desire it, but because I believe God desires for us to deal with it right now. Say, I've made a lot of mistakes in this regard. Well, that's why I love Lamentations chapter 3, because the Bible says his mercy is new every day. <laughs> what a great Savior we serve. Slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, in love. Even, even in love, he tried to correct Cain. And in love, he's trying to remind us today and correct us today so that we don't walk down a path that destroys our families because of anger. He's speaking to us. He's telling us from his very word. He's saying, hey, listen, here is a reminder of this. And I'm showing you the way to do right. My word tells you how to get right. And I'm giving you this opportunity to turn from this particular sin and have victory over this sin. And I will work in you and through you to give you that victory. But what is our response? Are we going to get angrier? Or are you going to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for allowing, forgive me for allowing this emotion that you created in us to, be, to become something that you never designed it to be. God, help me to get angry over sin. Help me to get angry over wickedness. But not to get angry in an unbiblical way, but to be angry in such a way that I go and I stand up and I speak truth when I have the opportunity. Oh, there's so much to learn in this passage and we could have gone on and on. And I'll be honest with you. I struggled to get out of that message yesterday because my wife told me it was way too long on Friday. Yesterday, I cut a page of notes out. You can tell her thank you later. Will you do, will you do yourself a favor today? Will you open up your heart to what God is saying to us today and do business with him? If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, can I tell you, anger will be a problem for you. It's a problem for me and I have a relationship with Christ. So I can tell you that if you don't know him, it's going to be a problem for you. Okay? But it's not one that he wants us to linger in. He laid himself down so that you might be forgiven and have everlasting life. Maybe the Spirit of God has drawn you to that point today where you want to call out upon the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of sin. I encourage you to do that as unto the Lord. Whatever your need is, I pray that we as a church, we as individuals, will make use of this invitation like never before. Father, we love you, we thank you, and praise you for your word. God, I pray that you'll be honored and glorified during this time of invitation, and we'll be careful to give you the praise for it. For it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus that we pray. And for his sake, amen and amen.